Yes, sir. If you ever had a second chance, you better be thankful. If you ever had a second time around, man, I've been through it. I lost out and I faced what the first wrong. Feel no hope. Bad thoughts choosing to die, go home When I was sitting up on that gray hill My mom went through these zones like you got none Lost everything, it's no good feeling alone Hey, pops had no dollars, life didn't make sense How did I end up back where I started, what did I miss? I went from condos to pops house On calls, now bus routes And the one person who had the key to my heart Took it and checked out What up, what up, it's your boy Paul P I serve God, I'm not God This is just my opinion and welcome to another episode of the nothing to some podcast so today we have a special one for you guys today we got a leader in the building a community leader who got a story to tell the one and only michelle Irvin. how you doing i'm great you aka Shelly on uh aka Shelly on <laughs> so how you know how's your how's your everything going you know living that cali life and everything like that you know how how is your day how is the sun treating you and everything like that i mean the sun is always going to shine you know even when it ain't shining and it's gloomy the sun is always shining yeah, yeah you know yeah. so i'm just loving you know everything that it brings to life yeah yeah you know? definitely so definitely. the sun is definitely a powerful beam yeah, into, yeah. Into life, man. Nothing like Cali, though, right? Ain't nothing like California. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I ain't gonna say you know California love, but uh, <laughs> it ain't nothing like that Cali weather. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, it, ain't all, it ain't always love in Cali. Oh, you know. We know that. We know that. You know? you know. But um, I'm excited for you to be here today. You know, um, since this is your first time. We want to get you nothing to something story, you know, starting from the beginning. We want to go back all the way back. Is that okay if we go back? We can take it as far as back as you would like to go. <laughs> okay, okay, cool, cool. So let's start from the beginning. Um, where did your beginning stages of your life start at? My beginning stages started in the Bay Area. Oh, in the Bay. Yeah, the Bay. Okay. Bay Area, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so what was it like growing up in the Bay? It was poverty for me personally, you know. Some people think about, especially the place that it is, you know. You just hear about a lot of great stories, you know, come from a, it's like a, a good foundation where you really wouldn't even know that poverty even existed yeah. unless you lived in it. So, wow. yeah. Wow. And for people, see, people, when they think of the Bay, they probably thinking, of course, Sacramento or you know, uh, San Francisco, maybe even the, uh, the the Golden State Warriors. Give them a little bit of like exactly where you come from in the Bay. I come from a, the, I would say a little town called Seaside by Monterey, Carmel, Pebble Beach, you know, that type of era area. And some people be like, that ain't the Bay, but we by the beach, you know, we run co the coast. So I consider it, you know, the Bay because of the beach, but it's like Seaside, California. Wow, wow, amazing, amazing. So, so you know, growing up, you know, down there as a child and everything like that, what was that like for you? It was like, what can I say? I saw a lot growing up. I saw a lot growing up, I would say from the age of 6 to 13, that a lot of people wouldn't die living their whole life out in that, to 80 would have experienced. I'm going to say that. Wow, that's no joke. That's no joke. Now, did you have um, both parents in the household? No, my mom was a, a single parent, and um, my father, they were like night and day. Sometimes I would be like, how did y'all hook up after seeing my mom's lifestyle and then seeing the life he lived? I'm like, this was impossible, but it made me realize as I got older, God needed those two, um, them two bodies to meet so that he could create me because my mom's side is a generational curses. My dad's side comes from a strong warrior clan that gives me the power that I have to break those curses. Wow, wow. Yeah. That's amazing, that's amazing. Now, you know, growing up, so you grew up, you know, closer around your mother and everything, right? Yeah. Okay, so so what was that like, you know, um, growing up around your mother? Like, did you, you know, uh, did a lot of things as you got older, like, come from that relationship that you had with your mother growing up? 
I couldn't say that I really had a relationship with her. Okay. You know what I mean? I'm going to be totally honest. We didn't have a relationship. And I could say even right now to today, she still don't know what colors I, I like. She still don't know what make me cry. She don't know nothing really about me except from where I'm at today. You know, and um, I can say growing up in that household, it was like a lot of dysfunction. It was a lot of poverty. You know, I went from watching her go with her as a little girl to Soledad prison, you know, things like that, to her dealing with this individual that got out of prison that was like from the gorilla a family, you know, black gorilla family. So he lived in those 70 days, you know, was a lot of big time drug dealing, a lot of things going on that, you know, children should not be subjected to. Um, I watched him go to prison. I watched her eventually end up, you know, with pimps, watched the pimp prostitute's father come chase him out the house, shoot him. I watched my mama strip prostitutes with shotguns, pistol whoop. I didn't seen it all, you know, growing up as a little girl. Went to school just to eat, you know. So a lot of people really just didn't understand the struggle of going to school just to eat and regretfully not even wanting to wake up just to face that day. Wow, wow. You And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that you point things like that out, you know, because in our community we don't talk about these things enough. And, and we have to understand that these things, even as adults, affect us. You know, we we bury these things, you know, but those things were not normal. You yeah. know, going through seeing someone get shot, getting, seeing someone get murdered, you know, going through, you know, seeing pimps and drug dealers all around you. That isn't normal, you know. So I think it's important that we talk about these things and and we all understand that, hey, even though we saw these things, it's not something that we should think is something that it should just be shown in the hood. You know, if we come up in those areas and kids this is okay for kids to see, you know? You know, we, we, we could really like, you know, we could we could go through things as adults because of these things. So it's good to talk about it and, you know, people may be dealing with it in a traumatic way. Would you say that you dealt with these things as adults in a traumatic way from seeing these things as a kid growing up? Most definitely. I can say because coming and growing up and having a mother that has a lot of, you know, disrespect for her daughter or talking to her daughter in a manner. And then on top of that, you're out there prostituting, you doing drugs, but then you have this man that's sitting back and watching the division between your mother, the saying how much she don't like you, calling you out your name, saying certain things. I wish I wouldn't have had you. I wouldn't piss on your brain if it was on fire. Things like that. Like, what do you, like, how do you say this to your 12-year-old daughter? You know what I mean? And so when you ha when you are a mother and you're dealing in that type of tone, you have these guys that sit back and they're pedophiles. You know what I'm saying? So he's watching the division. He's seeing the vulnerability and he's trying to come in, coming into my room naked. You know what I'm saying? But I always had these posters hanging over my bed. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. These are things I had over my bed at 10 and 11 years old. You know what I mean? Um, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep, you know, these type of spiritual anointing that I had and, and the covering that was around me that even when he would come in my room naked and he couldn't even touch me. You know what I mean? And so those are some of the things and to be able to try to tell your mother these things without feeling like you're the you go from being the victim to being the accuser now she's accusing me of why this man made the choice that he made and caused her to dislike me kick me out at of the house at a young age and i had to go live with my grandmother because she refused to believe you know what was going on wow wow Definitely. I'm um, sorry to hear that and everything. You know, um, did did you have siblings around you or anything like that as well, or was you just a single? Child? I was the older. I was the older one. I had two younger brothers. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, how was the relationship between you and your your siblings? Well, by me being the oldest, you know, they had to look up to me. I went from being the babysitter to be being the full time parent. 
So now that at an early age, I have to go from babysitting to my mom not coming home for three or four days. Them looking up to me like, what are we going to eat? I don't know how to cook. So now that I'm then have to get in there and mix and max what they done stole from us, the hamburger helper. That I was hamburger helper, you know. What I'm saying? Yeah. I was taking the hamburger meat with the macaroni and cheese and trying to create a meal. You know yeah. what I mean? So I end up going to full-fledged motherhood at the age of 11, 12, and 13, which never gave me the opportunity to really have a childhood for myself. Wow, wow, that's deep, that's deep. So 11, 12, 13, going into that position and direction where you have to take on the responsibility of as a mother when it comes down to your younger siblings. What are some of the things that you had to do to make sure they got food on the table, make sure that they was gonna be good, you know, until they got up the next day? What were some of the things you had to go through at that time? I had to learn how to wash and flood the house out with a whole bunch overusing the soap powder. I done flooded the whole house out. There's bubbles going everywhere. You wow. know, um, I had to go through trying to figure out God. I would go in the mirror and look like, why did you make me be born to have to go through this? You know, this is what I'm thinking as a young child. And I'm glad that suicide wasn't going on back then because that would have been something I probably would have contemplated because at that age, you don't understand why am I here in this situation dealing with this you know by myself all alone and then having a grandmother that's spiritually rooted you know because I could have went on my to my father's and that family over there but my grandma would come and be like baby don't leave your brothers you gonna see one day God gonna bless you mm. you know what I mean those are the type of things that kept me holding on to not wanting to leave my brothers, you know what I'm saying? Because listening to my grandma, I knew it was some value that she knew, some wisdom that I needed to stay there for my little brothers, in which I did, and I had to learn how to cook. And one time I tried to fry some chicken and give it to them, and they opened it, it was bloody. They said, Mama don't cook it like this. <laughs> <laughs> Mama ain't here. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, well, I could at least tell that y'all y'all was close. Y'all had a pretty good bond and everything like that when it come down to your brothers right yeah we still do right now today that's dope that's dope now around this time we also know you have to do what you got to do to pay the bills you 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 got to make sure if you know if, if i'm the person who's going to make sure that they good in this household and, and and mom is not providing i got to make sure that they good are there things that you had to go through to to to, to get money to put food on the table ever during this time that you may think of like I would not do that at this point in time, but I had to do what I had to do to make sure that food was on the table. I could say at a season, my grandma would always kind of bring us food because, you know, we were so young in those times. It's not like exposure that it has with this generation that we're dealing with now. So it wasn't that kind of exposure going on. It was more or less, you know what I'm saying, surviving. You know, I'm taking what we had and working with it. You know what I mean? My grandma bringing food over there to make sure we ate, so on and so forth. Then going to school, like I said, just to make sure we was able to get breakfast and lunch. And then coming home, my grandma would come and bring us something. And we, I used to be looking like, why we can't come over your house, grandma? Because my mom was like the black sheep because of her situation she had to go through with her, her dad being a child molester and things like that. So her kids was like blackballed. So my grandma would always try to come and make sure we were good, even though we weren't welcome over there. But I can say, you know, growing up eventually, when I began to become like 13, I was forced to get a boyfriend to come in to protect me from my mom's husband. So with him becoming my boyfriend, now he became the provider. He was bringing things that would help sustain me and my brother. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So now 13, 14 years old, you know, you a little bit more in a place where I'm doing whatever I got I got to do. You know, I I got, you know, you say your boyfriend, you full flesh taking care of your your siblings and everything like that. Is this kind of where the the streets and things like that started to be, become more visible to you? You started to see what's going more out, going on out there when it comes down to violence, when it comes down to drugs, when it comes down to things like that. Is this around the time where things started to become more visible around you when it comes to the streets? I could say at that time, I ended up getting pregnant, I think at 15, and I ended up having a baby at 16, but I wasn't able to go back home. 
So I had to sleep in cars, sleep on somebody's couch. I had to get in where I fit in. And so one day my cousins moved from the Bay Area, from up north, and they moved to the Imperial Courts, you know, projects in Watts. In Watts yeah. So I end up calling her like, hey, me and my baby, we sleeping in a car. She like, come out here. And so once I came out here at the age of 16, that's when a whole new level of life was introduced to me. Mm. So so you came out here to the home turf, Watts. You know, I say home turf because that's where I'm from as well. You're right. You know, Watts, California and everything like that. Yeah. So what was that transition like going from the Bay to now? Ooh. You and Watts, Imperial Courts, no joke. What was that transition like for you? I can say back then, I believe it probably could have been 85 maybe back at that time. And at that time, I can honestly say it was like wild. It was something that I come from living what I thought was abnormal to coming into the jungle. So now I'm really in my wilderness experience. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm really like out here going up against bears and lions and everything you could think of and me being just a sweet individual that never had to be a fighter, that never had to, you know, get in the field and, you know, demand my respect maybe a couple of times when I was tested. But now I'm here at 16 with no mama, no daddy, no brothers, no uncle, no nothing. So it's like me, now I'm, like in survival mode, you know. Um, I can honestly say in that time, you know, you have to see no evil, speak no evil. I didn't know coming because I've never experienced prison. I never knew, you know, jail and that lifestyle that they lived. So now this op introduced me to some stuff. So now I'm hanging around gangsters, killers. You know what I'm saying? They was my protectors. My boyfriend, he was a real lokesta. So he was my protector, wouldn't let nobody mess with me. He made sure I was good. But the flip side of it, he done primo. So he had me doing a drug that I was unaware of, but I'm in survival mode. So whatever, you got to go with the flow with whatever's going on just to have that shield around you. Wow, wow. That's that's deep. That's deep. So 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 now you 15 around 15, 16, 16 years old, you know, um, in a whole different world in survival mode. Knowing, hey, I got to do what I got to do now. What are some of the things that you had to do to survive at that time just to make sure you was going to be good at the end of the day? Well, some of the things is because when I moved with my auntie. It was like maybe 15 people. You know, back then, families was thick. So you got 15 people in a two or three bedroom. And so if you don't get in at a certain time, you ain't going to have nowhere to sleep. Uh -huh. So, okay, let me let make sure my baby has somewhere to sleep. So I might have to have met a guy and just have to have sex with somebody just to have somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Around this time, too. Is this around the time where you, you said you got introduced to, to drugs and everything like that, right? Eventually. Yeah, so when did you start getting into the direction where it's like you you wasn't just taking them, but you wanted to start getting involved more in a drug lifestyle as well? Well, this guy that I was end up dating, he ended up getting a life sentence. So once he got a life sentence, boom, I broke away from the drug situation. And that's when it became more like the party, th the party thing now. Now I'm meeting different girls and we going across the tracks to Grape Street, you know what I mean? So now I'm over there finding myself in the Joy Downs and I'm like, you know, I like the vibe, it's kind of different. You know, I respect my people from, from PJs because they taught me how to survive in the trenches. You know what I'm saying? They taught me the rules of the game. They taught me the, the street codes and the politics and how to stand 10 toes down and when the doors was getting kicked in in the PJs because murders that was being taken. I'm 16. The police is like, look, we're going to take your baby. You feel me? And I'm like, well, hey, the what the things I'm experiencing, you take them because at the end of the day, somebody going to have to get him out of the system. But me being able to use wisdom because but me never going through these experiences, but knowing that it ain't wasn't back then, snitches get stitches. It was like you snitch, you die. Yeah. So it's like you take him, I'm going to die anyway, and somebody going to have to get him. So do what you got to do, officer, because I can't tell you something I don't know. So I learned I learned how to how they play their manipulations with the police and try to make you say stuff that you don't know, but use your child to try to get you to speak on things you don't know. So a lot of people get tricked up like that. So once he went and done his life sentence, boom, now I'm over the tracks. you know. And that's when I met 
my my boyfriend, you know. Okay. Okay. He was from over there. He yeah. was a family man though. Wow. Okay, okay. And before we get to that, um, um, did that did you ever lose your children to the system or anything like that? I never lost my and son to the system. And that's never a did. Yeah. So, you know, God that wasn't part of the plan. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And were, were you in high school at this time or you was like, you know what, I don't got time for school? I could say I was going to some pregnancy school on 103rd. Okay. So I still was trying to, you know, find my way through some type of, to get some type of education, uh, you know, just be, because that was just probably the right thing to do, not even knowing, because I'm in survival mode. But when I see my other friends say, hey, this one, I'm going to school, you got a baby, you can go there too. So it was just different people guiding me and navigate me to where I should be going. Okay, okay. So, so going back to, so you meet your, your, your boyfriend uh, across the tracks and everything mm -hmm. like that, and now y'all together, um, and, and now you're about to go into a whole different lifestyle, you know, and everything like that. Where did your life go from there? My life went from there, from me meeting him, like I said, need somewhere to sleep, went there, stayed about three or four days, me and him was locked in, his mama liked me, went and got my son, and psh, we ended up moving in with him and his mama and stuff like that, so... Okay. Then, you know, eventually I turned 18, got my own place, but he was the one that sold drugs. Okay. So he introduced me to that lifestyle. Okay. So now getting introduced to that lifestyle, you kind of seeing how, you know, the system work when it comes down to the drug game and everything like that. Yeah. Um, what was kind of that first introduction for you to really get involved with that lifestyle? Just seeing that it was sustained in the household. It was paying the bills. My kids were not going through what I went through. They had school clothes. You know, I was able to fix the house up, and I wasn't I wasn't in poverty, even though I was in poverty. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It was money being made. It was a lifestyle that was offered to me that had never been offered before. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, it was it was it was cool. I could say definitely definitely so when did you start to get to that place and phase in your life where you was like I'm all the way in this you know I'm really a part of this right now it's going good it's great but I'm here when did you get to that place when it came down to being a part of now the drug business I could say with him he really like he really wouldn't allow me to sell it but once I seen, okay, you're on Primo's too. So now I have to learn how to chop the dope up and put it together and package it up and sell it. Now I'm learning the, the game because you're over here getting high on your own supply. I'm not on what you own. I'm seeing the money flowing and I'm looking at my, my, my son. Then I end up becoming pregnant with by him with my second son. So like now I'm in mommy mode, survival mode, money mode, and I'm just in all the modes that it takes in order to, you know, keep moving forward and get this money flowing. Mm. So for a while, was everything just going smooth? There was no issues? You was just making money and everything was good? Or were there up and downs that y'all were facing? I mean, for the most part of it, they became like a family. Like it's different. It it was a different type of uh, of it was a different type of aura coming from the PJs to great because I was surviving and survival but over there they became family. It was sisterhood, it was brotherhood, it was unity, it was love, it was togetherness, it was like something you just wanted to be a part of. It was protection, it was everything that and don't stand for it now. I could say that. Yeah. You could scream out the window, hey, go on, girl, let me get a cup of sugar. Let me use your mop. And mm -hmm. wasn't nobody talking bad about you. It was just all love that it was founded on. You know what I mean? Wow. So I really loved what they gave me. It was, and I've always been a leader. So I've never allowed nobody to push me into making choices that I did not want to make. I wasn't being bullied. That's one thing I stand 10 toes down. You're not finna bully me. You know what I'm saying? And that's the thing I loved about me through this journey. I was always a leader. Mm. And they respected that with no brothers, with no uncles, with no nothing. I was able to be in the trenches with real goons, real gangsters, real killers. And they all loved me like a sister. Mm. So I, I earned my respect just because of the love that was inside of me that I never got. So it's something I, I earned for. So I knew how to treat those people that showed me that love. Mm, amen to that and i think that's important you know you know no matter where we coming from no matter what we have all dealt with i think that's important that we always make sure that we show love because right now we see so much division 
like you said, at that point in time, it felt like it was love. No matter, yeah, I may need some milk or I may not have money for this, but we came together. We wasn't as divided. Now you see so much division, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that it's important that as a community, we get to a place where we could feel like that again amongst each other, you know? Yeah. So I think it's important that you point something like that out. You know, um, at this time, were you also um, um, in the, the gang you know, side of it as well, or you wasn't, you know, gang banging and everything like that too. I could say that, you know, being 17 and these people, you know, I lived in the PJs and I love them. They're my family. But over there, me being naive to gang banging, but loving what it was, what I seen because it wasn't killing like I see today. It was like people like, hey, we just want to put in some work, get your kids in the house. You know what I'm saying? It was OGs that wasn't letting the little youngsters go out there and put in no work. It's like, we got this. You know what I'm saying? Versus what I see today. So I could say I didn't mind throwing up the G. You know what I'm saying? Because I felt like that was a family, but I didn't feel like I was a gang member. Got you know it. what I'm saying? But I didn't mind throwing it up because not representing it, but just being a part of something to represent at that time would make me feel like I had a family around me. So I wasn't a gangbanger though. That's what people be like, is Michelle from PJs or she from Grape Street? You know, I could still go in both walks of life and not have not one problem. Wow. You know what I'm saying? I don't have problems when I'm in the streets. Yeah, people yeah. respect me on a whole nother level. You know, you could call me the godmother of Watts at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm like a godmother of Watts to many, to a lot of guys that call me, as, we'll get to that, but yeah. Yeah. At that point, I wasn't no gang member. I didn't gang bang. But sometimes if I went out in the streets, if I'm in kitchen, I, but this on what you want to do? Yeah, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You said, let them know, like, hey, I stand for something now. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. you know, it just was a little metaphors, but it wasn't, it didn't, defi didn't define who I was. Yeah, I'm going to say yeah. that. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. You know, one thing I want to ask you, this is a little bit off topic, but yeah, I want to yeah. ask, you know, you know, because I come from Watts, too, and I always say, you know, Watts is one of those areas where you feel like you're being left behind. You know, like when the riots and things like that happened, a lot of buildings got burned down. Some of those buildings are still down to this day. Mm -hmm. You know, um, to me, Watts ain't got no better, right? Um, when it come down to Watts and what's going on in Watts, do you kind of feel that same way? Do you feel like Watts is almost like the city that is always being left behind when it come down to to Los Angeles, California in general. What are your thoughts when it comes down to Watts? I think Watts is being pimped. Mm. I'm gonna say that. Watts is being left behind because of the people that are in position and they're pimping the people. You know what I'm saying? So that's why Watts is left behind because of misrepresentation. Because they have a lot of opportunities that come, but they miss the opportunities because everybody wants the title, everybody get the money, but nobody want to put in the work. So they're working it's they work in the community instead of working for the community, for the people in the community. So, you know, I have my we'll get to that. I have my run in with a lot of, you know, people, you know, eating blood, money, things of that nature, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I could say that Watts could be could have been and it may still have the potential to be if you get all the bad people, you know, you say how they say the wheat and the cherry gotta separate. So all the bad gotta be dug up out of there. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is super random, but um, uh, <laughs> I, I know this is random, but I'm about to ask it. Uh, uh, who is Ted Watkins? Why did they change Will Rogers to Ted Watkins? You know, when I was around 14, 15 years old and they first changed it, I'm like, who is Ted Watkins? You know, what happened to the Will Rogers name that we grew up on when it come down to Watts? You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Who is Ted Watkins? What's, what's going on? Why they changed Will Rogers Park to Ted Watkins Park? I really don't have a solid... <laughs> answer for that but I can definitely say a lot of politics may go on and a lot of people may do certain deals with the city and you know a lot of people just have their own ways of you know working the system in certain type of ways to get them to be able to get certain recognition yeah. you know it's way bigger than us God, you know, it's, it's evilness and wickedness exalt itself in high places. So, you know, I don't know really the background on them, but I can guarantee you, you know, it had a lot to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You think Ted Watkins is a brother? 
yeah, I met oh, I met oh, the yeah. dad. I met the son. Okay. And okay. I met the son, but I think the original Ted Watkins, yeah, he's passed away, but he definitely was okay. a brother. At least he was a brother. At least yeah, he, he was, was a brother. brother. Shout out to him. Yeah, Shout he was a brother. That. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so going back to your story, you know, um things are things are going smooth, you know. It's feeling like a community, even though people go through up and downs. You know, I feel like a pretty tight knit community. You doing your thing, making your bread and everything like that, right? Right. When did things start to go into a negative direction? I can say when did things start going into a negative direction is um, my son's father, you know, doing his, like, you know, his, you know, drugs, you know, getting high on the own, his own supply. And then it went from that to me playing with a gun and accidentally shooting him and, um, me and me calling the police. I'm not knowing that I shot him because I was just playing with a gun, never picked up a gun the day before in my life and pointing it, playing like, you know, and he put the gun in him, you know, like that, 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 you know, playing it, put my finger in it, just boom, smoke went everywhere, called 911. People was running in the house after that because I thought when he ran out the door, he was just scared, you know, mm-hmm. but people running, he going to die, die, what you mean? Call 911, they take me to jail and I'm in Silver Brand for murder. Wow. So so this was not intentional in no. anything like that, nope. you know, when it come down to it, but they just put a murder charge on you. Yeah. Now, when it come down to it, um did you have anybody who backed you and said, "You know what? This ain't the way it went down," or did you just have to go through the system and face these charges that was on you? So the beautiful thing about it is that I never been up against the jail system. I don't know nothing about no penal codes. Now, today, I would have been nervous as hell. You know what I'm saying? Like, my life is over. But in my mind, it never left. Like, you guys are crazy. This is an accident. What are you guys talking about? Going to jail for the rest of my life. That didn't register to me because I'm only 18. You know what I mean? I've never touched the jail cells or nothing like that. So, me, in my mind, oh, they'll figure it out. It was an accident. This is what I'm saying. So this one lady, when I was walking, everybody was looking at me like, and I'm like, dang, why they looking at me like that, you know? So when I came in, they said, who you kill? I'm like, nobody, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm not knowing that. She said, well, where your paper at? Her name was Ruby. I said, here. She said, you in here for 187. So I brought my paperwork right here to show. I was really in it for 187. So the next day, they slid a paper under there. And so she was like there, like helping me understand, like, let me see what they put under there. So then it said attempted murder. So me still not knowing what's going on, all I know is that it was an accident and nothing else was registering to my mind but that, you know what I'm saying? So his grandmother, his mom, everybody was coming up there to visit me, putting money on my books and so on and so forth. So I end up talking to him. But me, it's still not registering 187 attempted murder. Like, I'm not still not registered to what's going on. And so going back and forth to court, ran that up for about seven or eight months. You know what I'm saying? So the lady was like, only two people come up in this cell is murderers or if you're going to, to back to prison. I'm like, I ain't never been to prison. She said, you're a murderer. So I end up. He ended up coming through, so when I would go to court, they'd be like, oh, you, I'm going I'm to make sure you get 20 years. And I'm looking at this person like, who are you? It was an accident, dude. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm naive to all of this. So good thing about it, my baby's father ended up telling them, hey, she didn't mean to do this. I want her to come home. We have kids. You know what I'm saying? And so when he came, brought, when he... Um, when I got released, they said, okay, well, if you plead guilty to assault with a deadly weapon, find a firearm, a great bodily arm, we'll release you today. It's I've been eight months. Okay, where do I sign? So when I got out, he took me to Martin Luther King Hospital. And it didn't still register to me until my, to my relationship built with God. Like, whoa, the enemy is trying to take me out. So he takes me to Martin Luther King and he introduces me to the doctor. He's like, yeah, this one shot me. So the doctor looked at me, he said, do you know if he would have died on me, I would have made sure you never seen the streets again in your life. They said when they brought him in, he was DOA. He said, I walked out of the doors. He said, me and three doctors with my head hung low he said a small voice talked to me, told me to go back in, grab a knife, 
cut his chest open, take his heart out and massage it, put it back in, and he came back to life. That's, Gave him an open heart surgery. Wow, so none. can't nobody tell me about the God I serve. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Because yeah, yeah. he had a plan yeah. for me. So so when you so when you shot him, where did you exactly you in know hit him at? In the throat. Okay, okay. So it was just one bullet in the throat. Yeah. And so I can relate to people that really stand on. I didn't mean to do it, but because of the evidence that's before you. Oh, you shot him in the throat. You meant it. You know what I'm saying? Look at all the damage that was done. You meant it. But nobody wanted to hear the truth because the world is so built on a lie and creating a false narrative in cases on individuals. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm able to stand for it. So now once they see that, you know, he's coming and advocating for me to get out, now they want to say, oh, it was a hair trigger gun. If a piece of hair would have went in front of it, it would have pulled. But you're not saying this while you're trying to get a conviction. You know what I'm saying? But so now you're saying these these things after I'm released. So I understood as I got older that the system is corrupt as well. As long as they can get a conviction, regardless if you're innocent, they don't care. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I want to get, you know, more into, you know, you went into the direction of uh, getting into your faith, which which is powerful. And we love talking about the faith here. But before I get into, get into that, I want to take a little bit of a step back. What was it like serving the time that you had to serve? So this this was your first stint in, in prison, right? This was a county civil branch. Okay, county, right? So what was that time like for you? You know, what did you have to go through while serving some time? Had to go through just, uh, what can I say at that time? It was just an experience that um, I can't even, sometimes the Lord don't even allow you to remember some of the things at that moment. And I can't even remember, you know, just the experience. It was just, I can't even remember. I can remember my prison experience, but I can't really too much recall that civil brand experience just except for going to court, waking up early in the morning, being chained to the, you know, just like things like that. You know what I'm saying? It was so young in my mind was probably not even in the reality of where I was at at that moment, you know? Yeah. So it was just a lot of things at that moment is vague to me yeah and you and you said your prison ex experience so you later went to prison for something totally different yeah that's when i went bigger in the don't game that's when i was having keys and kilos and things like that yeah definitely definitely wow so um eventually you get out you know uh before we get into that you touched on something and i don't know if it have to do with scripture but you said that's when you started to become more with with your faith connected to your faith after talking to the doctor in that situation um that situation drew you closer to god when you when you like heard the doctor say he wouldn't be alive if this didn't happen would you say that drew you closer or you wasn't in that place yet i was um, my grandmother always took me to church as a little girl mm -hmm. so i never went astray from that no matter where i was no matter what i was doing i still found a church home mm -hmm. you know regardless you know before the shooting even in the drug even being homeless no matter what i went through i've never went astray from the church house mm. it never wow powerful powerful so so moving along and everything like that um he eventually you know he's better you're out y'all you know happy family you know and everything like that where did your life go from there because we know we have some stuff that ended up happening but where does your life go after that situation after that situation i believe that i had hurt him so bad that I didn't want to really face what I had done to him. You know what I mean? So God always make a way of an escape. So I was able to go back. You know, we kind of was trying to figure out, is this still the right thing to do? Because I was the type of person I had sub, sub, um, suppressed so much anger and growing up, with all the things that I went through and it would be sometimes he would just do things even after that the judge was like don't pick up a knife you better not pick up a fork because if I see you back in here I'm going to make sure you x y and z but it would be something that he would do to trigger me and I end up cutting him you know what I'm saying I end up like still cut stabbing him like you know it's like I had this this monster living inside of me that if you come messing with me I'll be the sweetest person, but I can black out. And that blackout moment, 
I didn't want to continue to hurt somebody that hard, hard already came, got me out of jail. You're provoking me in your own way. So I felt that it was best not knowing how to separate. But when, when I went back up north, that's when the separation ended, it, ended wow. that relationship. And, and the stabbing was after the shooting. Yes. Wow. So so you ended up going back to the bay. Uh-huh. Okay, so now you back in the bay, you have the kids with you and everything like that, right? Yeah. Okay, so I'm guessing the bay is a little bit different now. You know, after being in LA for so long, right? Yeah. So so what did you immediately get into or get involved with, you know, uh when you first got back to the bay? When I first got back there, I see my grandma again. I see my family. I see my roots. You know what I mean? So it's just like I see my little brother. It was like a Joseph experience. You know what I'm saying? Wow. Being sold off to the slaves. But then seeing your family like, oh, my God. You know, is this something you don't want to break back away from? And so the reconnection was able to reconnect. And once I reconnected with my brothers and my family again, I was able to get away from all the wolves, the craziness, the evilness, the wickedness, and get back to reality. It was a part of reality that was able to get back in me from my roots. So there, I'm back out there, but now I'm seeing big money. It went from making crumbs to going to a whole nother level. It was like New Jack City at this point. Wow. <laughs> I'm on New Jack City status. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I done learned the game. I'm New Jack City now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, some of the biggest, you know, uh, uh, people of that time when it come down to the drug gang, because I remember I was talking to Freeway Rick, and he was talking about a couple of, you know, uh, people he was connected to in the Bay when he was doing this thing, you know. So, uh, you know, uh, I think I th I, one of them I, I've heard of, if I'm saying his name right, uh, was it Lil D or, or uh, you know, some, something like that. Uh, There's a lot of little Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, you know, you know uh, he, he, yeah, he did. I saw him do an interview. He, he served a, a long stint, but, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, he was out there in the Bay doing his thing. But now you in the Bay, you see the money that's being made in the Bay. Ooh. And you want to get some of this money. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I was getting some of that money. Okay, okay. <laughs> so what got you involved? How did you get involved with getting some of that money? How did I get involved with getting some of that money? My cousins was getting money. My little brother, he 13. You know, he's still in survival mode. He get money. Yeah. Everybody around me getting money. Ain't nobody that was around me that wasn't getting money. So it was only right that I got in, learned where to go, how to where to maneuver, and I start getting that money too. Mm. And I left a whole house and never came back to L.A. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's wow. how much money I was. It was out there. And so he begged me, yeah, you let me keep my son if you just choose nothing. I'm like, okay, least I can do is let him keep a son. Yeah, you know, yeah. here, you go ahead, keep him, you know. This least I can do for you. Yeah. Now, was you on the level to where you making a name for yourself? People know who you are. They know you are that one. Was yeah. you, like, on that level with it? Everywhere I go, I become that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You make you go in. I was that one. Hitting the streets and Watts right now, still that one. Go to up north, I was that one. Yeah. And I used to have dudes like, dang, you know what I'm saying? Because I used to be knowing how to have that talk. Hey, baby, come over here. Come speak. Let's stop letting these dudes over there beat you out your money. Come spend this money with this woman. Go show you some love. <laughs> so dudes are like, man, I need to get with you because you got all the money coming to you. Yeah. I went to having all the money. Everybody, I'm not going to say everybody's money start, but I start getting all the clientele. Uh -huh. All the clientele love dealing with me because I was the type of person I outthought other people. Okay, if your rock this size, let me make mine double the size. Mm -hmm. So now not only am I getting the money from the people that's getting high, but I'm getting money from the people on the streets on a lower level too that's trying to survive because they could break them in half and still do what they do. So I learned how to, you know, take the sit, uh, the street life and just make it work to my benefit. Wow, wow. So, so just asking this question, what was like, all right, not too good day for you. And what was a great day when it come down to them ends? You know, can you kind of break that down for us a little bit? You get what I'm saying? When it come to that ends, at that time at your height, what was like an eye day? What was like a good day? The good day was, it, I'm going to be honest, it was some, it was some, every day I woke up was a good day. Because if you go from being a person that was overlooked going to school, Nobody don't want you to be around them because you don't wear the same. You ain't fit in because you don't got the school clothes. You outcast. So now here you go 
balling out of control like now everybody want to be with you you know everybody want to be around you like everybody trying to vibe like who where did you come back from like how did you come back this strong and now you all the way up here so now you got those people that never paid you attention want to be a part but i wasn't I was good on them type of people because I felt like I was a person that always had morals and integrity and you overlooked that because I didn't fit in with the material things that you guys felt would be good in your group. So now I love the underdogs, you know what yeah. I'm saying? So now I'm putting all the underdogs on because people didn't want to mess with underdogs. If you ain't on they level or higher, they ain't finna let you eat from they table. Yeah. So everybody wasn't eating, was eating when I came around because I was dealing with those people that reminded me of me dope dope and when i'm saying a good day what i'm trying to get to is what was you making <laughs> that's what i'm trying to get to boy oh lord it was like uncountable money it was like i'm trying to tell you i could say i was in new jack city but i was halfway I had my baby daddy from kitchen. He coming from L.A. bringing me four and five birds. You know what I'm saying? Mm. I'm like that. But I was never the type of chick that wanted to go out state. I wasn't finna fly to another state because the money was so good right there. I kept the birds on ground level because I ain't finna fly. I'm not no federal type of chick. Yeah, yeah. I'm state. I'm going to keep it right there. You feel me? Because it's money good. Got so it. birds, we ain't flying nowhere. We stand right here. <laughs> and so I was able to supply so many different individuals and people was like well did you ever like being behind the scene like nah I like being in the trenches because in the trenches I was able to see mothers who didn't have food and so I would be able to go buy their food stamps and go back and buy groceries you know what yeah, I'm saying yeah, yeah. they kids not having clothes I'll go buy their kids clothes you know things like that so yeah. the money was I mean it was a I touched some level. really big 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 money yeah. and it's like dang I don't got nothing to show for it but I touched a lot of money wow wow I was locked in with the Mexicans and everything yeah wow wow and and, and as we know you know everything going good and, and, and moving smoothly you making your bread mm -hmm. you know um, on top of the game but everything comes to an end eventually right yeah so how did you get to that point to where this situation and being that top dog in the bay came to an end i can say what was my breaking point um i was seven months pregnant and my daughter's father was murdered um so in that time of that murder i could say people were still making money but people kind of were scared to come outside and so it we it created a big gang war war out there like it was a lot of murders that had started taking place. It went from just all of love and family to now everybody's on the edge, don't know who's gonna get killed next. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that became, so even though I was still getting money, but it became a slow process. It wasn't fun in it anymore. Mm -hmm. It was like everything was sad. Now that I'm seven months pregnant, having to bury my daughter's father and mm -hmm. go through this alone and, you know, being broken once again. So, you know, your spirit becomes broken. And so, you know, during that time, um, so many murders were going on and I've always been a peacemaker. So I can go into a home and see the dudes that might leave out the house and go shoot my, gun my brother down. You know what I'm saying? Because he was heavy into this retaliation mode. You know what I'm saying? So I would go in the house and see about five or seven dudes with big guns in there because me and their sister was still cool. Mm. But they noticed Michelle to leave out. Her house ain't getting shot up. Ain't nobody getting killed. Michelle's really solid. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So during that time is when they um, said, call, they called me after so many murders and the dudes from the other side like, hey, Shelly, why don't you call your brother and let him know let's end this war? Mm -hmm. And because they knew my brother was like, you know, like he, the, him and my hit my brother up, hey. And the, hey. And, the, and, the, and it's so crazy because my brother be like, if it wasn't for you, I would be dead. But because of the respect these big dogs have for you. I'm talking about big dog dudes that would just come and throw me a, a kilo. Mm -hmm. Hey, Shelly, what's up with you? You good? 
Like, man, nah, I'm kind of like, woo, up. Here, take this. Just come back and spin with me. I'm talking about dudes that had like 60, 80, 100 keys. Mm. Like, that was calling shots. That had people really on. Had a lot of respect for me. And they would see my brother, and they'd be ready to jump. Gun, hey, I'll jump. Hey, what's going on? What's happening? Yeah. They put the guns down. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It was times where I'm somewhere chilling at my sis' house. I'm stumbling out the house. Stumble out the house. Soon as I stumbled out, we drinking. I stumble out. They slid the van open. They jumping out with guns. Like, hey, what y'all doing? These ain't the dudes on my brother's side. These are the dudes that's out there retaliating on my brother friends. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh no, y'all got to get back in the van. Y'all got to get up out of here. Y'all can't come do this. They get in a van respectfully, five goons, and get on. Mm -hmm. That's the type of pull and love I had. You know what I'm saying? And so. Once my brother, I call my brother like, hey, bro, they like, let's get back to getting to this money and end this war. My brother like, nah, I ain't with that. They tried to, we said that before, they tried to kill me. They almost killed me. God removed him. He was looking at life. So he made that call to the street. He told him, hey, we've been locked up a month. It ain't been a shooting. The police know who's bringing the noise. Whatever my sister doing, y'all niggas better get with it. And they got with it. Mm. And it was a truce and the gang warfare was over. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, but so, so, you know, it's a truce, gang war, and you go through your trials and tribulations, but you know, okay, everything is cool right now. You eventually go to prison though. What led to you going to prison? Being having a three, a four year joint suspended and just doing something dumb, having big money in my purse, but still want to go in the store and just take something when I could have easily paid for it. Knowing I had about 10 ounces in my purse, knowing I see the police standing outside, it's just God have this crazy way when time is up, time is up. And you just don't understand the foolishness. You think about it like, I could have paid for this. I could have put it back. I could have done a million things. I could have threw the dope. I could have done the right thing. But when it's time for change, ain't no right thing. It ain't no right time. And I went out there, got cuffed up. You know what I'm saying? They found the dope in my purse. Then I end up um, bailing out. Time to go turn myself in. And I went on the run. <laughs> mm. I went on the run. And, and how long was you on the run for? I was on the run. I say for not that long, maybe about eight months due to okay. somebody setting me up, you know? Okay. Um, and so at that time of packing up my stuff, I'm like looking at my kids, can't leave my kids, who they gonna be with? Who gonna take care of them the way I take care of them? Yeah. Who gonna love them the way I love them? Yeah. Like I gotta pack up and I didn't even think twice. And I said, Lord, if you bless me to make it to LA safe. I know you said it's better to let your no be knowing your yay be yay. But if you let me make it, I promise you, I will never sell dope again. Mm. At that very moment is when your backup is up against the wall and you tired and God is tired of you. Because I didn't went to the county jail a gang of times. Don't get me wrong when I was out there for different things. I went to the county jail and I would always say when I get out, I ain't going to fight no more. I end up fighting, carrying weapons, drawing down. Mm. I would always have a zeal to want to change because when I went, every time I went in jail, I always picked up my Bible. And it would always speak to me about change and it caught my attention. But when I got out, I didn't know how to change. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Even though I had the desire to want it, do it in my heart, I just didn't know how to do it. And so I went on the run, get back to L.A., Inglewood, and uh, end up getting a place. And some things happened where somebody I trusted, I end up letting them hold some money and um, they didn't want to pay me back. So they was working for the police and they set me up. And that was a whole nother level of something that the police was mad about because what they tried to set me up and say what was going on wasn't going on. But at that time they were telling me, hey, I don't got your money, but I got some dope. But it's crazy because when you have an anointing over your life and a discernment, I'm going to pick up my money because he tell me to come pick up my money. But while I'm going, I see a police and I just start shaking. Like, why am I shaking? This person don't even live nowhere where the police should be looking at me like this. So when he come to the car, he like, hey, I don't got the money, but I got some dope. I'm like, I don't sell dope no more. I told God I'll never do that again. I don't want the dope. Give me my money. You feel me? At that moment, had I took that dope, I would have been in a worse situation. And sure enough, that 
person that police that was watching was waiting on him to give me that dope i later on found out Mm. and i didn't take it so because it was a few going on with me and this certain individual um they end up setting me up telling the police i had big big pounds and pounds and pounds of weed in the car and when i get in the car and i'm kicking the car doing you know the police and the projects they got the informant so i'm kicking the car after you know i'm clicked up and the crazy thing is that we was exiting the freeway and i looked at my sis i said this person is about to set me up they told me to come pick up my money but i told the two people in the car with me when i we exited i said they about to set me up and the car got quiet when we exited got out the car Hey, you, come here. Click, click. Took me in. I'm trying to lie. But after that, they was going to take my friend to jail. She already came out here from the Bay just to drive me because she had the L's. And I'm like, I ain't finna let her go down. You know what I'm saying? Let me just go ahead and tell the truth. I gave her my name. And after that, I'm screaming, he did it because he don't want to give me my money. And they was like, who? Mm. I said the name. They was like, oh. So they tearing up my car. Tearing it up tearing it up they like she like why are they tearing up your car all the time when the police figured out when i said a name they knew this person used me and i'm like i let this person borrow some money and this is what they gonna do to me he said who did you say and he said oh. he got in the car he said yeah they told me you had big pounds of weed he said i'm mad as a mother that's how the police talking he said they got me with my lieutenant helicopters captain i'm thinking i'm gonna make a big bus and this is about a person okay i got that person he said can you get out of here he said i wish i could let you out right now if you wouldn't have gave me your name that's how mad the police was because mm. this person railroaded me and used that to get me locked up but lied to this police and me not even knowing that this person working for this police officer. Wow, wow. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Definitely crazy. So you get locked up. You Like you say, thank God it, it, you really didn't have all of those that yeah. in your car at that point, point in time and everything like that. Nothing. It was over. Yeah, so so you get locked up and everything like that. How much time did you have to serve? Two years. I've, okay. Over four years I've done two. Okay, okay. So you do your two years and everything like that. Where did your life go after that? Is this when your life started to go into a different direction where you started to change your life? Yes. Okay. What were the things that led to you wanting to change? Was it your circumstance or did you go through something in prison? I didn't go too, through too much in prison. Okay. I told God, me and him had a good talk. And I said, there's two things if you want me to get out. Don't put me in a room with a lifer because don't nobody bully me. Because I don't go by uh, prison politics. And don't put me in the kitchen because I don't wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. You know? <laughs> as long as we can do that, we're going to slide through this. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You got me, I got you. And these are the two things I'm asking. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so that's what he honored me. And I went in there. And in there, he just started talking to me. I kept opening up my Bible. And it would go to, you know, uh, the narrow gate or the wide gate. You know what I'm saying? Choose life or choose death. They would just flip open to those pages every time. Yeah. And so at that point, that's when he started me and him had such a profound relationship it's like you know he talked to me like you know change i'm like change what challenge yourself to change change what change you mm. change and i was like i don't know what that looked like and i didn't even know what he was telling me at that point about change yeah. but i was willing to go through the fire and find out after what 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 does that he said challenge yourself for change mm. so I was up for the challenge. Mm. And let's break it down really quick. So you said when you was in, um, you know, prison before you got out, God kept on leading you to a direction in the Bible, you know, a certain scripture, a certain word. I want you to kind of like give us a little bit of like where God was leading you and why was he leading you in that direction? Because he was saying choose life or choose death. Mm. And in that he was basically telling me and then I had a dream and the dream is what what because when you have to start building that personal relationship when he knows that you made that concrete promise a lot of people don't want to make that promise because they know if you go against that promise you're going to be in a world of trouble and i was willing to make that promise people don't want to do it because people are not sure if they can stick to that script you know what i'm saying but i was willing to make that make that promise and not go against it to be obedient and so what he was telling me is choose life and in life, you'll be blessed. Your children will be blessed. 
their children to be blessed and the generation will be blessed. And if you choose uh, um, a curse, these are the things that you're going to be facing. Then I start reading what go on in the narrow gate and the narrow gate is obedience is structure is faith is trust is believing is hope. It's something that a lifestyle that you got to get used to living. The narrow gate is go get, get back out there and sell dope. Get back out there and come back here. Get out there and possibly be dead. Get out there and live lustfully. Get out there and do whatever you big and bad enough to do. You know what I'm saying? And that's what the not, the wide gate offers you is all the negative choices. And the narrow gate offers all the positive choices. And for one time in my life, I wanted to see what that positive and positive choices looked like and felt like. Mm. Special, special, and 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 what's uh, just so people can know because people probably listening like I want to know where to find it. Well, uh, give people the scripture where they can find you know uh, uh, everything that you're talking about Google right it. now. You know, I was gonna say I see you in Philippians. Google I'm, it. I'm big, I'm big on. I see you in Philippians. I was gonna say I'm big on Philippians. Philippians four thirteen. I can do all th- things through Christ who strengthened me. So I'm like you. You in the right place. You, you know, know what I'm saying? Philippians, Proverbs. You know, Exodus. You know, a lot of things that could really change your life so yeah. that's beautiful that's beautiful yeah. so you get out of prison you on you in a you're going in a direction where you're like i'm about to change my life i'm going in the right direction and you start to get involved um in watts you know um you know uh uh city council things and everything the community uh-huh. involved with you know helping the community and things like that what are some of the things that you started to get involved with once your life started to change well i can say when i got out of prison i got out of prison in sacramento Okay. Because that's where I end up moving once my um, baby's father was murdered. I said, well, I got to get away from here and start somewhere fresh. So I end up getting out of prison. And so I met my parole officer. I'm like, look, check this out. I can't stay out here, bro. He said, huh? Little Mexican dude named Hector. I'm like, I can't stay here, Hector. He said, what do you mean? I said, I got to change people, places, and things. He said, what does that mean? The people I know I could go get the dough from. The people I know I could sell it to. The places I know I can go and get it off and the things I'm going to become accustomed back to to, to living, I'm, I got to change that. Yeah. He said, you know what? I ain't never heard nobody say that. He said, I said, I still got my place in, in Inglewood. After two years, my landlord still kept my place. People be like, what? Yeah, still kept my same place. And he said, Michelle, he was a black man. He said, I own these. He said, and I know they were, they took, when I, and the thing about being in prison, it wasn't just prison, it was the things that came along with it. It's like, I got in the fight, I have to be right up free for 90 days, 120 days. If you get in another fight, you don't get those days back. My fa- my daughter's family on the father's side sent me paperwork while I was in prison saying they took my daughter from me. I met an angel, a lady, an older woman that she was like 70 or something that come from administrative that did all my paperwork, typed it all up to get me a court date. So when I got out, I can go back to court to get my custody back over my daughter. So now here you have getting custody back over your daughter, a person in the room that don't get no packages, a person in the room don't care if they go back to their kids, a person that's jealous because the person that worked in the kitchen always wanted me to cook because I have some skills. So every time she bring a chicken, I want Michelle to cook. So you have somebody that's envy and jealous and hateful, evil. That would always pick with me. Now there's eight women in the room. So she would always pick with me. And I look at her, tell her, it's bees like you of why I'm in here. Because y'all come playing with me. And when it go left field, we going to asset. It ain't no fighting and stopping because I don't know how to stop. I said, but guess what? I'm going to have to learn how to discipline myself. Because this battle, I don't always have to fight. You understand what I'm saying? I'm used to fighting. I get in the field with them quick. But I'm realizing the trigger of the person that I pulled a gun on. You out here acting like you 187 you act like you want the funk but when the funk went down you call 911 on me so i'm looking at you as her because this is one of the reasons i'm in here because this person on the street carrying pistol acting like she hard bulldogger you know what i'm saying 
didn't want the smoke once the smoke went in the air. So now I'm telling you, you remind me of them bras that going to have me in a situation. And God is like, do you want to get out and get your daughter back? Because your court date is February the 20th, March the 6th. Your release date is February the 20th. You get in a fight, you're losing it. You're not getting out to get your daughter. So now I have to pick a choice. Am I going to let this one person that don't care about life control me and what I got to do? I got a house to go home to. I got kids that's waiting on me. I'm not finna allow my street mentality to come here when I'm fighting with everything I got to change. And that's what he was saying, challenge yourself to change. That was one of the biggest things I ever had to do was she caught me one day when everybody was out the room and was picking with me and I had to grab her and choke her and slam her in the shower to let her know you playing with the wrong one. But after that, the picking went on. So I said, you know what? I'm going to roll up. I ain't never rolled up out of nothing. I'm going to go to a different dorm. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, God honored me and sent me to Live Oaks, where it was just 100 women in the room. After that, he sent me to the halfway house. A girl had just got rolled up. And they was like, I'm like, what happened to her? Because there's only four people. They was like, oh, she had a gun allegation. In my mind, I'm thinking, I got a gun allegation. Now I got you to brought me this far, to roll me back up and send me back to the pen. So it was two black dudes. One was a sergeant, one was a lieutenant. He says, so tell me about this gun. I'm telling them. They look at me, so it was an accident. I said, you see, I didn't go to prison to do no time. It was an accident, man. God gave me favor, like, like prison guards, favor. They said, you know what? We're going to let you stay because of my change because I was willing to roll up. And that was the first thing where God was showing me, you see what if you got changed, you see the favor that come with that. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's how things was moving forward and flowing for my life is those little steps right there. Wow, amazing, amazing. And you say when you got released and everything, you got released in the Bay, but then you ended up coming back out here mm -hmm. to California. Well, you're in California, to Watts, California. Uh -huh. And you got involved in the community. I did. What led to that? What led to that is, like, people, some of the, uh, you know, the younger, like, some of the dudes, like, hey, Michelle is fit for this intervention work. She got the connections in all the hoods mm -hmm. with the Grave Streets, the PJs. If we talking about gang reduction, she's the one to make it happen. Wow. So wow. he brought me to the table. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know, uh, I... I always say when it come down to individuals who are in positions that could change a community, it should be people who have experience when it come down to being in the community and also experience with living and understanding the experience of the individuals that are in the community. You get what I'm saying? So I think that's a beautiful thing. So what I want to go over really quick is what are some of the things that you are doing right now at this current moment Excuse to help me. change and, and grow and build in the community right now okay. in the hometown, the home turf, Watts, California? Uh, let me be totally honest with you. A, a, amongst doing the gang intervention and prevention, I was able to, they said they wanted people from Egypt development. I had the place flooded out with so many different hitters leaders, shot callers, people that was really just really calling shots, flooded the place out. The dude said, who did this? He said, I told you Michelle got the connections with him. The next time we came to the meeting, the dude from the Nickerson said, she got to get up off the table. She got to go. So I'm thinking like, oh, he Muslim, you feel me? He on some power trip type stuff. You know what I'm saying? He mad because I'm a female that got this type of leverage and this type of pull. So this is why he want me off. Yeah. So that contract ended. So I kept going back to the person that brought me to the table. Like, hey, what's the deal? Why ain't nobody, like, bringing me back to the table? Like, and that's when I began to not understand. But he came to me like, Michelle, this is crazy. I'm like, what's the deal? He like, man. We got to go shoot up the developments. I'm like, who? He was like, man. I said, who told y'all y'all got to do that? And the dudes with the programs. Because if they, if we, if it's a, if it's a truce, then they ain't going to take the money off the table. So now the, this is how they create the war. And so this is why I understood nobody wanted me at the table because I was stepping on their money. I understood why this dude got mad because I was for peace and they was for eating blood money. 
So it was kind of, you know, once I knew that, I learned the dynamics that I was a problem to, I was a solution to the problems they were living off of. Wow. So wow. I had to, you know, kind of like, you know, it just was horrible. It was a bad, it was, it was a sad moment for me, to, but it didn't stop me from being that godmother of Watts. I still had, I'm still in the field, so yeah. it didn't stop nothing. You know, I just seen a gang of wicked people doing a lot of wicked work. Wow, wow. So, so currently, where are you at right now with everything? What, what is it? What is something that you need the people to know with your, your your movement and what you doing right now? You know, with trying to help the community and everything like that. You know, um, and what is a message that you want to put out there to the people? So, what I'm doing now is that um, when I got out of prison, I done that and I stuck around for a while and relocated back to the Bay Area. Went there and. St- Musad again, you know what I mean, and was able to create a nonprofit organization called A Better You. And my motto is Why Waste a Life When You Can Build One. Um, I was able to sit down and write a movie, plays, and you know, I was able to sit down and let God work on me individually away from all the chaos. And so, moving forward, I went while, the, while back in Sacramento, I did a peace march to end the silence, stop the violence. Um, I did three peace marches. The mayor, everybody, the city councilman, a lot of people got involved. They wanted to implement me in the budget. I went to Solano Prison, and I was a speaker there. They gave me a year gay pass. They wanted me to do a program there, but I was out here. Um, what else did I do? I, I also got ordained as a pastor. Mm. I was preaching God's word, saving lives. I was wrote movies, wrote books. Um, i done a lot of things. I haven't totally published it, but I wrote a play and things of that nature to be able to bring something back to the people. You know what I'm saying? And so when I came back, I came back with a plan. And so I wasn't planning on it. I was planning on being in Sacramento and God said, back up, go back. My people need you. I'm like, what? I got it sold up out here yeah, with the schools yeah. and everything, you know. Yeah. So I, me being obedient, gave up my big, beautiful home that I was renting at that moment and moved in on 93rd and Central in the alley, pulling up with trash, rats, roaches, <laughs> all of this, and bebop hood. And, I, you know, they got a lot of love over there with the bebops and stuff like that. And um, from there, I created uh, uh, the program, but when I came back, what I thought I was coming back for is was totally something I wasn't ready for. But God prepared me. It was a lot of young girls coming to me. My mother took my baby. CPS took my kids, you know. And I'm like, what? You know, what you do, girl, for them to take your kid? You know, that's what we automatically think, that you've done something wrong. And I stopped hearing her and listened mm-hmm. and figured out that she was being railroaded. So I went and joined the uh the neighborhood council, the Watson neighborhood council, sat on their board because people don't respect stakeholders. They respect leverage. So I have my badge. I'm an elected official, and I'm standing ten toes down, and I'm using it as my power tool to do what I got to do to help the people. And so I was showing up, making sure girls got their children back. You know, I was going up against DCFSS on their corruption and things that they were doing to come into the communities and poverty communities where they know you can't afford a lawyer, where they know that they're railroading you, and this is how they create poverty and gentrification and things like that. So I kind of start learning a little more about politics and hood politics and how the system works against, you know, the um, the lost generation, I'm going to say that. So I helped a lot of young girls get their children back and brought them in my house and let them stay with me until they were able to do so. So I just that's why they call me Godmother Watts because I help. I've helped and I still help a lot of people from guys, everybody. So I came back with a plan and helping them, helping these young women get their children back was definitely something that just turned into something that was beyond my imagination. Amazing, amazing. And you know, we definitely gonna, uh, we, 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 we got to because I feel it's a lot more, you know, to tell. We definitely going to get us a, a part two uh, uh, going uh, of this uh, amazing, amazing interview and amazing story, you know. Um, but any, any shout outs 
that you um, want to shout out or anything like that? You know, let the people know where they can find you and everything like that. Uh, yeah, the, definitely the shout out would be to, um, I also have a podcast, if I don't mind. It's called the oh, Shelly On know. Show. You know, um, I have some up and coming, you know, people that I've interviewed. Um, so, you know, sooner or later you can find me on, you know, YouTube on Shelly On I wasn't prepared for that, but it's Shelly. <laughs> um, what else? Um, I don't know. I have these amazing shirts that, you know, I push that I created, you know, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, you have a nonprofit and it's beautiful. Let me Definitely. put this on the floor. Okay. So I created my shirt. Says, I was on my way to hell, but Jesus paid my bill. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, this is my own little um, signature shirts. This one says, I used to sell Coke, but Jesus, Jesus is dope, and now I push hope. hope. Amen to that. Amen to that. I love it. I love and it. And this one says, Jesus is dope, and I'm addicted. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, um, I would just like to give a shout out to opportunities. I like to give a shout out to success. I like to just give a shout out to the Lord, definitely, that is ahead of my life. He's like the main biggest shot that I can give out to anybody, you know what I mean? And then all my doubters and haters and everybody like that, I want to give a shout out definitely to them, you uh -huh. know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And all the people that believed in me, I want to give a shout out to my children. I want to give a shout out to Seaside, you know what I'm saying, for this journey that I went on. I want to give a shout out to my PJ families for believing in me and never giving me problems, even if my son was from Grape Street. I want to give a shout out to Grape Street for always, you know, pushing me to understand that is always love. So I just want to give a shout out to love that is the anchor and the foundation of life and I'm going to give a shout out to everybody that's still fighting for change and that really believe in the process that's not giving up in the trenches you know yeah that's one of my favorite stories Michelle this was amazing appreciate you so much so much so much hey definitely hey everything go support she's amazing amazing an amazing story uh it's your boy Paul P Michelle Irvin God mother of wise right that's what it is Man. you know what i'm saying <laughs> no all right no the deal keep it real that's all <laughs> i know you know um you know i'm not holy than thou that i'm no earthly good i'm still hood with an anointing to destroy the yokes you know oh. what i'm saying and you know i'm just up for this next journey you know going to the higher heights be looking for it for this movie i didn't wrote you know what i'm saying there's more to it than just this i have movies and i have a lot of great things in the mix so you know those are things that people can look for hopefully to be a somewhere to be a pick me up you know what i'm saying hey. let my life story be a story that need to be on to be in different places netflix you know so i'm just looking to go higher you know what i'm saying in life and Definitely. bring everybody and bring people like-minded people with me i'm not selfish it's not about me it's about people that's been obedient and sitting back and waiting for them doors of opportunities to open and for us to walk in and take what the devil tried to steal amen amen all right all right your boy paul p the one and only show Irvin, that god mother love you all we out of here deuces, deuces. <laughs>